Hello and welcome to the Fan Zone. Um, we are here. It is National Racehorse Week this week. I know we're at the dressage, but I'm going to bring that up because our next guest uh, knows all about racehorses and actually turning them into dressage superstars. I'm and it's not Bobby Haler. I'm here with Bobby Haler, <laughs> but uh, she is here as my a resident expert up on the stage. Um, we are live on social media and Facebook. So if anyone's got any questions for the wonderful Louise Robson, then do write them in. Um, I've got my screen here so I can shout you out, give out any shout outs you want or any questions that you have for Louise. But Louise, you are on the stage because you are an expert at all things changing thoroughbreds from going flying past the winning post and making them do flying changes. Um, and you are the owner of Thoroughbred Dressage. Thank you so much for coming on the stage. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a massive privilege to be here and to be called an expert with the thoroughbreds always takes me back a little bit. But yeah, that's what I do, it's what I love. and. That's what we have at home. <laughs> and you have to love it, don't you? Because thoroughbreds and dressage not always go that well together, but you are the one to bring it out of them. And you have to do it for the love of it, don't you? You really do. When you're kind of being galloped off with for the 95,000th time, or you're going down that centre line with your horse going like a giraffe and questioning why you do what you do, you have to go, I love my job, I love my horse, it's part of the process. But it's so rewarding and it's so fantastic. And it's fantastic to be able to give these horses a second career post-racing, regardless whether or not they've just gone down to the start or they haven't even made it down to the start or whether they've won a million pounds to give them another avenue post racing is fantastic and that's what national uh, racehorse week is all about and i'm sure you've been involved in it it's about showing people the love for the racehorse and this second career is so important and um, i'm guessing you kind of got thrown in the limelight quite a lot by one of your very special horses we have to talk about him now we have to bring him in early on quadrill owned by her Majesty. I mean, I am a massive fan of Her Majesty. My dog is even called Queen Elizabeth II. So to ride one of her horses, bred by her, I mean, first of all, how did that even come about? How did you, I, I just want to meet Quadrille. I want to, like, is he here? I, like, he is famous to me. <laughs> He is not here, um, mainly because sometimes in the bigger atmospheres he doesn't thrive. He'd rather show off his antics and how supple he is in all other ways than dressage asks for. Um, <laughs> The joys of riding quad um but her majesty retraining for her majesty even now when i say it out loud i just go did i really say that is that really possible and when we visit her it's kind of become normal but then you walk away and you go yeah that really did just happen um but i've come from a place of if you want to call it no money my parents didn't have money we grew up well we grew up in a very happy loving home but we had lone horses so a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend had a, that was being courted by a gardener of Windsor Castle um, they met Terry Pendry who said we've got a safe horse available for loan he's safe but he's maybe not safe enough for the monarch of the country who rides in a headscarf safe but he is safe and <laughs> I had lost all my confidence funny enough on another ex race horse and I just wanted something to hack and we went we met Mr Glum and the story went from there Amazing. Um, and you, oh, she's got a microphone up. I know well, she's got questions. Jenny. Let me. Um, but um, yeah, so Bobby, I'm going to pass over to you. Um, and I'm guessing you want to know a little bit more about Quadril, but how you get these horses to go from flat out gallop and running away, which is what they're kind of leading the pack to actually staying with you. And uh, I know that Bobby's got lots of questions. Yes, absolutely. So let's take it back to the very beginning, because I think this is a brilliant part, which I've just found out from us discussing, um, that you were out there with what I think you'll explain it better, but Monica Theescu, you're out there, three-time gold medalist. She's now the trainer for the Olympic team, and since she's been training them, they've won a gold every single time, so she's got it right, hasn't she? <laughs> Just tell us where it all started, your, your journey with Monica to now, where you are now, basically. Yeah. So I went to university. I'm actually a part qualified architect. Um, my parents still question my sanity sometimes, um, but again, it comes back to the love of the horses. So I finished my architecture degree. I Googled German dressage trainers because I thought I want to make a go of this and I want to go to the best in the world and Monica replied to my email and I went and based myself fully with her for 18 months with Mr. Glum my first x-ray horse from Her Majesty 
And then we came home, but I spent the next three, four years going back every month being her traveling groom. So I got to do, if you want to call it the young person thing of traveling, I just got to travel with horses. So I got to go to the best shows in the world and experience this lifestyle that was just phenomenal. And then when Monica retired in 2012, I kind of retired my international show groom career, if you want to call it that. And then I came home and I set up Thoroughbred Dressage. And that alone is such an incredible experience that I know mean, I definitely as a rider recommend for the younger generation to do, to go out to Germany. Um, but obviously that led you into then doing what you're doing today. Tell us, where do you even start getting something that's supposed to gallop a full pelt, lengthen and all of a sudden condense and be adjustable to be able to compete somewhere like here? I think what people have to remember is that it is a journey. So if you want something to be a quick fix, your racehorse maybe isn't your go-to project. But if you want to have something that you can work with for years and go beyond maybe your expectations, the racehorses are so intelligent, they're so bright and they want to give us so much. It's just making sure that us as riders give those horses the time that they deserve you know yes they've got to go from long creatures to condensing sitting on their hind end when they're built to go naturally onto their shoulders it is possible but i think as riders and retrainers we've got to say to ourselves what are we working with how do we get this horse to work for us and why do they work in the way in which they do so when you're trying to canter a 20 meter circle and they fall onto their shoulders or they fall out to the side you've got to go actually this horse is built to run in a straight line so for now that's normal how do we make it better we never force it but we say okay these horses can work on their shoulders so we can turn the shoulders we can't necessarily put the hind leg under but we can turn the shoulders out of the way of the hind legs and then naturally the hind legs kind of underneath their body and you go oh okay that works and then progress from there it's not any magic formula it's just a case of going this is the horse I've got aren't they wonderful let's celebrate them and work with them as a horse you do the same with a young dressage horse you go how does this horse work how does this horse tick it's exactly the same with the race horses they're just really intelligent they give you almost too much early doors and their body's not ready to do the job their brain's ready to do you could take a race horse and take it from racing to pre saint George in a year their brain would go yes 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 their body however would go uh, not possible but you know they've got that intelligent that thrive that want to work you know they work from two three four years old and they are workmen it's just how do you kind of then take that and put it into its new role and it's very interesting then when you're saying about the fact that in a year they could go from racetrack to present George, but physically. So for people at home, and I know I teach quite a lot of people with X race horses, which is absolutely fantastic. I think it's a brilliant thing for them to have a second journey in life, isn't it really? But I think it's a, a thing to talk about is try not to get too frustrated about it. How much more time would you add on, do you think? It depends on the horse and it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the rider and how the horse is left racing. I normally say to everyone, the first year to 18 months, if you get through that sound and problem free, then you're on your way but like we always talk about the foundations of training walk trot canter on the bit and changing the rein on your racehorse is the hardest thing to do once you've got that there you'll fly through the levels it really won't be a problem but that foundation work is your hardest bit and people are then always quite quick to go well it's a thoroughbred versus a warm blood that's not the case the thoroughbreds are their own horse in their own rights and it's not that it's us versus them it's just this is my horse how do i develop it finding a great trainer that will then go yes let's support you and help you rather than Ugh, it's a thoroughbred it's not going to work actually go no it's the thoroughbred we know that it's possible we've just got to give them a bit more time and a bit more patience and the rewards will be huge I'm just going to interject there because the stream went down. So anyone who's just <laughs> joining us uh, on the uh, live stream, um, this is Louise Robertson and she is uh, the rider of quadrille. I'm just going to drop that in again because I love the fact that you ride for the Queen. I love the fact. You can come and ride in one day. Can I? Of course. Oh my you God, I love that. Her, yeah. yeah, I and love you, that. I'll meet you up at Gallop, so I'll, I'll meet you at the top. It's fine. He was her derby prospect, so he's not slow. And does it like when you have to put down on when you enter him into um, the different? I, what comp what's he competing at now? Into two level. Into two. I was going to say PSG, but amazing. He's he's cracking the PF and the one time changes. They're amazing. A bit raising at times. So on the start list, it goes owner. The Queen. H queen. HM the Queen. It's when the commentator, when I trot down the centre line, if I go to something kind of bigger, they kind of I trot in. They go, this is Louise Robson on quadrille owned by the queen really and then they go okay owned by the queen let's go with it like it's, you can hear the pause because you think really does she own dressage horses and then they read further down they go ah oh, runner at royal ascot got it racehorse <laughs> amazing and have you met her yes 
Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> We're not talking about horses for a second. Um, <laughs> what was she like? What did she ask you? Did you have to curtsy bow? What did you do? The first time I met her, I was on a horse. So I did Google, how do you curtsy on a horse? And I did ask someone, do I have to get off curtsy, get back on? I don't know. No one tells you this stuff. Um, but it's just normal. She loves her horses, and that's the primary thing, is that... It's the love of the horse, and she just, she, quite frankly, she would like the horses just to be well. She wouldn't care if I just took the horse for hacking for the rest of its life. As long as she knows that they're happy and they're, ha they're sound and they're healthy, that's all she loves, and she, she loves to hear the stories. But then she also regales stories of their mum, their sires, watching them at the races, their siblings, and she is so knowledgeable. It's incredible, but I said, it becomes normal, and then you walk away and you just go, that was the queen. <laughs> legend. She is such a legend. Um, and we've just had a first question in on social media, actually, uh, from um, Camilla. Um, is there a different approach between retraining flat horses and uh, national hunt horses? Which is a great question. Good, I love that, that question. Such a good question. Um, so the sprinters are obviously fast twitch fibres, and then the national hunt horses are kind of what you call stayers. They go for longer distances. The national hunt horses have then stayed in racing for longer. So they're used to actually being having breaks and then being picked up and I always describe the national hunt horses as more of gentlemen versus the sprinters that are like your teenagers so the sprinters leave racing at an early age so sometimes when you first get them they are literally bouncing off the walls and you're going oh I've got to get on that oh goodness but the difference is is mainly their confirmation so the natural national hunt horses are bigger and longer so they may find like a 20 meter circle easier just because they've got more room to move whereas the sprinters sometimes feel like you're on a drift car like you're trying to turn and just falling out the side door. Wheel of death going around. Yeah, and you're just thinking, what am I doing? And then someone says canter, and you're like, no, please don't make me. But then the sprinters are fantastic for sideways work, for lateral work. Because they're so short coupled, they can sit and they can turn. They can also sit and turn in a negative way when they're young, but they can sit and they can turn and they can go a lot easier. The lateral work's great for them. Whereas the national hunt horses, that's when they start to struggle a little bit. And they've got that many more years on the legs, which again, it's not a negative thing. It's just something to be mindful of, of this horse has been doing this job for however many years I just need to remember that it's maybe really difficult so Safa Daru you must, Safi he won £350,000 racing he was fifth in the Cheltenham Cold Cup he's Grand National winner he is doing phenomenal in his second career but he does find like the basics like a contact quite hard because he has been racing just that little bit longer mm. whereas the sprinters they sometimes more have like little leg injuries or they just haven't been quite good enough but they, again, just need the time because they grow. As soon as they, st they stop galloping every day, you need that downtime because they stop and then all of a sudden they shoot up. They haven't got the pressures of racing on them anymore. So you really need to take your time with the baby horses and just give them that little bit more worldly experience because the National Hunt horses have seen a little bit more grown up, matured a bit more. The sprinters are just like, wow, this is life. Excellent. And do you think, um, obviously, um, Bobby, your horse is very different to the type of horses um, <laughs> that Louise is training. But do you, I'm guessing there's parallels that you're listening. I can hear you noddling, nod, noddling. I don't, sorry, it's a new word I've just invented. Um, <laughs> nodding away there. Um, but I'm guessing one of the things when you're training at your level, you're trying to teach people all the time is patience, patience, patience. I actually think like maybe a few people rode some race horses and gained that patience actually might do their training of the other horses um, some good. And I have to say what I think it would do is really make sure that people have the understanding because to be able to train a warm blood, okay, they're a little bit more built for this, aren't yeah, they, than the they race are. horses. So you can get away with so many things with them. They kind of have a natural three beat canter and they can collect a little bit easier. But they have you you physically as a rider have to know what the horse is supposed to do underneath you for you to be able to do it because yeah. you are the one to physically make them do it. It's true, but also with the race horses, we have to remember they can walk and they can canter. So when people do a sole thoroughbred versus warm bloods, I'm like, actually, most of my thoroughbreds, because I also train para horses. You see these massive walks on these thoroughbreds and go, I can make that a power horse. That's brilliant. And then they can walk and they can canter. And so then you're like, well, actually, they can naturally canter in a three-beat way. That's not an issue. It's then when you come into the collection, people think of closing it and shutting it down, which, again, you don't do, which is just training. It then yeah. becomes a case of you're no longer just training a racehorse. You're training a horse. It's, and I think people get that conversation quite confused sometimes. That's really interesting. And so you do all this work at home with them and you get the sub corners and you teach them everything that we've been discussing so far. How does their attitude change then when you take them to their first dressage competition? I mean, the warm up situation <laughs> alone is a completely different thing. The warm up is different, but what you've got to remember is these horses have been brought up as herd animals. They always go to the gallops as a string. They go racing 
as a group. They don't do an individual thing. So actually, sometimes the racehorse is the hardest thing. Well, one of the, some of the hardest things can be when you get a big moving horse cantering towards them. They're not a fan of that. But normally, it's when you take them away from the warm-up into the ring that they go, I'm on my own. I don't normally do this on my own. What's going on? And they just get a little bit inward or a little bit afraid. And that's, again, where we've got to give them the time, but also the education of... Have we taken them out and done arena hires? Have we taken them somewhere and done the training with them? Have we given them the time to mentally process what it is with their new job? Because when then as, with us as a rider, we go in and we go, we want to do really well. And we panic and we hold on to them and they go, what is going on? Like you normally hold my hand and now you're leaving me to it. You've got to give them the best start, the best education and the best way forward. So you need to do the arena hires. You need to take 20 of your mates with you and go, can you please just come? We'll all ride together and then I need to take them somewhere else and work work them it's unfair to expect them to understand this and then when you come to somewhere like this which is phenomenal you've then got your racehorse that hears loudspeakers like races here we go and again that is your responsibility with your horse and your relationship with your horse for which you have to do but sometimes you also got to go do you know what they are struggling today we've got another day tomorrow it's not the end of the world and i think that's a really top tip there you know embrace it and make sure you give them the exposure don't hide behind the fact that they're going to react and get lit up i mean it's in their blood actually expose them to those situations to allow them to learn how to develop within it so that's really really interesting and you've also got to remember that they've come to the races and they've used their adrenaline to help like enhance their performance in eventing show jumping polo they still get to use that adrenaline kick in dressage it's quite hard because you go everything you knew prior don't do it like don't have the adrenaline kick stay calm and their body is going blood racing blood racing so again that's where you've got to let them take in the surroundings and understand that actually we no longer need the adrenaline kick and we need you to stay with us and that is you and your horse as a partnership so for all those people that are at home watching this and a lot of people are going to rewatch this later and they're going to have a lot of ex racehorses is there like two top tips that you can give them that they can take away just two um all hundred don't yeah, worry you can go keep going we'll like, just keep rolling we'll go and have a cup of tea you just talk to camera <laughs> for a bit. And i'll be yeah. like 926 <laughs> Um, my main tips would be you've got to love your horse for your horse never compare it to anyone else you know you've got to love that horse and appreciate that horse for what it is what it's done its history but then also get to a stage where you move past that and go this horse is awesome I love them for them and I'm going to show you what I can do tip number two would be to get a really good trainer on side you need a real or a trainer and support team so you need to fall in love with your farrier um, and give him god knows what or hit him or him or her at Christmas to say thank you for all the loss shoes you need a good physio a good saddler you need a really epic team behind you that understand you and your horse and those you really need them and um just um a lot of people now i mean when you're teaching you hear a lot of people go i'm going to take on a retrained racehorse i'm going to do that um you do need a bit of experience don't you and if you don't get a trainer because they are sharp aren't they and they are probably sharper than people think and when they get them home for that first uh, few months do you give them time out in the field is it or do that does that make them then more naughty when they come back in or is it like right straight on with a bit of training and then i'm going to give you time out what's the first kind of initial things that you do when someone says this is what i'm going to do it's difficult because again it's each horse has its own situation. If they've come directly out of racing and they've literally finished racing the day before, you need to ride them away. You can't just throw them out in the field and hope for the best. That doesn't work for them, their brain, that's not fair on them. If they've been worked down and then they're ready to have a bit of time out, then you go, right, go out to the field. You've also got to remember that these racehorses, some of them don't understand the concept of just go to the field. So you've got to still keep within their routine of what they understand. Ideally, what we do is we try and turn them away, take their shoes off, let their feet kind of sort themselves out post racing. And so we kind of let their body completely relax and then we build them back up again. Um, but for anyone that takes one on, I would just say you need a stellar trainer. If you've never had an X-Race horse before, they can be sharp, but also from us as a British culture, we see what might be, what's a racing fit horse. We might see that skinny. So everyone then goes, I need to feed them up. And then they feed them up and they get on them and they go for a hack down the road, they fall off. Shock. It's kind of, we've got to build these horses up over time and give them the time, but also not be too quick to make them fat and feel well, because we've got a blood horse that's you know, it's built for performance. So you're kind of literally sitting on a Ferrari and you've just got to be like, right, we need to bring you back to Skoda mode. Like, 
I need the I need the progression. That's an interesting fact. I hadn't even thought of that. And it's kind of not anthropomorphizing them. Don't think, oh, that's what I think, and that's what I do to a human. Don't suddenly think these horses. They've almost they've been living off their wild instincts probably more than any animal, any horse that anyone will have trained with before. Yeah, and also they're very routine based. You've got to remember in the race yards they are loved and they are given the like 10 gold star standard like even if it looks like it's got a slight bit of heat in the leg a vet is cold and then they're used to going out on the gallops every day in their order in their string the stables are done a certain way the lads the lasses they are fantastic they're given this like absolutely stellar care so when they kind of move from that they've then got also their kind of support system as a horse has gone so you've got to go actually i need to be able to replicate that and sometimes like the situations that we're in if we put them then on diy yards which we all have we all go there you've then got like potentially 40 50 60 different horses moving in different directions and this poor racehorse goes hang on which group am i going with and you're like we again have got to be responsible for the situation we put them in yes they need to adapt to our lifestyle but we need to be aware of where they've come from and how we best make that transition and if they get a bit jittery in the stable when they first come out of racing they might just need to move we all know horses like to move in general but especially race horses the front door has to be open when we ride them and if they get a bit jittery they've got to be able to move and Bobby, are you open more thoroughbreds in that warm-up arena and in the main ring? Are you looking forward to seeing that in the future? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important. Like I said, they need another job. Yeah. And what a perfect way of doing it. And it was really interesting there how you were talking about the fact, actually, fundamentally, they need to have a solid routine, don't mm -hmm. they? Especially when they come away from that. And it's no different than if you're talking about, you know, your, your warm blood. It's amazing how much, if you have a good, solid routine at home, how it, it changes their personality. They thrive in it and they find comfort in it. But then we do as humans. Like, we do exactly exactly the same and it's kind of if you want your horse whatever the breed to thrive they need to know who their people are what they do and like, again it's even breaking it down like things like when you take a thoroughbred to its show for the first time have you already platted them at home and seen how they've reacted when you plat them like i plat them and ride them at home then put them away because for some horses that's a trigger some horses you put travel boots on them that's a trigger some horses if they don't go out first thing in the morning and you get the lorry out that's a trigger so instead of then trying to kind of make them do something break it all down and go okay i need to provide the routine to make you happy and you understand the job and then you've got a fantastic horse wow there's just so much to think about i think you just have to be prepared to take it to another level don't you and just really understanding and watching what your horse is doing and let them speak to you it's just there's a lot to think about there is so much to think about but equally the positive is to it when you've got that relationship with that racehorse, they would literally do anything for you. They are proper horses and they will fight for you till the end of the world. They are brilliant. So rewarding. And have you found that um, Quadrilles become kind of a bit of a spokesperson for racehorses moving into dressage? It, he has, and which is fantastic. And I just, I always want that encouragement forward. I always just always say to people that Quad is an example. He's not an exemption. So yes, he's exceptional in many ways. And when he throws himself around, Jesus, he is, he is exceptional. But he is an example. So it doesn't just stop with Quad. It's kind of, I want to show what is possible. We've got horses coming up behind Quad in our stable, but also as a massive kind of, We've got the retraining of racehorses organization that support these horses and want to show off their diversity and what they're capable of. But I really want the riders to be able to move forward and show off. Go, I've got an ex racehorse, look what I'm doing, rather than saying, I've got an ex racehorse, so they can't do this or they can't do that. That's not the case. You've got to celebrate them and show them off. Well, he is amazing. And I'm guessing um, you thoroughbred dressage is your business, but I'm guessing if someone's worried or and needs some advice, you are open to it because um, there, there's going to be a lot of people out there who want to do this. And, and it is perfect and it's brilliant to take on these horses, but you will need help. So I'm guessing they can reach out for you. Um, look Louise up on thoroughbred dressage. Thank you so much for Thank talking you. to us. I'm going to take you up. I'm coming to meet. Come right, Quaddy. I'm coming to meet <laughs> Quaddy. Um, and um, then I can just message Liz and be like, yeah, I've, I've ridden your horse. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen him, I've hung out with him. And I think also the main thing I want to say is also you're not alone when you're retraining a racehorse. And quite a few people feel like they've got headaches or stuff and you are never alone and there's always help out there. There are people reach out, ask questions. People are always there. You are never alone in this. And I really want to put that forward. It's a fantastic community, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. It's so supportive. It's so supportive. And it's making the most of that. Kind of, we're so lucky in this country because other countries don't have aftercare systems for them. We are so lucky with the umbrella that we have with the jockey club, with the retraining of racehorses. There are so many incentives. British Dressage do the associate championships. If you don't want to do pet plans or regionals, there are so many opportunities for them. And I would say, grab it with both hands, take it forward and really celebrate. I'm on an next racehorse. Look what I can do. And also, I have to congratulate 
congratulations. Wasn't Quadril retrain racehorse of the year? He was. So he was in 2019. He still holds it because of COVID from last year. So they haven't really... <laughs> Reigning champion. And you've been doing quite well here, I see, as well, and the results. Uh, yeah, so he's not here this... Because oh, yourself, on a on different myself, horse. Yeah. On different horses, yeah. They're all doing really, really well. Really Excellent. Well, um, look out for Louise out and about around the showground because um, she's got so much advice to give. But thank you so much. I am a massive fan of retraining racehorses. I've done a few X point to pointers myself back into the eventing world. I couldn't get one to PF if you paid me. But what I think you're doing is amazing. I'm very much much looking forward to meeting Quadrille one day. Um, thank you so much for coming on stage. Um, so much useful information. I love it. We could talk to you all day. But for now, thank you, Louise. That's been thank absolutely you. brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.